This is our express video for NEAT MDAs and today's topic is diseases of salivary glands. We'll be discussing only the really important topics and it will be marked in red which are super important and the points will be as crisp as your potato chips. The points which is mentioned in this video is inevitable. So starting with stone formation or silolithiasis. 80% of all salivary stones occur in submandibular gland. This has been asked multiple times. 80% of salivary stones occur in submandibular gland, 10% in parotid and 7 in sublingual gland. Reminder occurs in minor salivary glands. Now, why it is more common in submandibular gland that is because the secretion of submandibular gland is mostly mucus so the viscosity will be higher therefore it is believed that this is the reason why salivary stones are more common in submandibular gland and now coming to the treatment part as you know in surgery for us the treatment and the important occurrence or complications are most pivotal so here the treatment either you can gently probe and take out the stone sometimes it will be necessary to slit the duct or open the duct and then release the stone whether it is any gland submandibular parotid or sublingual or any minor salivary glands this is the same procedure which is done in case of silolithiasis this figure shows silolithiasis next is ranula Ranula is arising from sublingual gland and it is an extra vessation cyst. On the contrary, you should know what is a plunging ranula. That is, normally your ranula, you know, it is a bluish swelling in the floor of the mouth, often displacing your tongue. But sometimes it may push your uh, midline, that is, your myelohyoid dehiscence in the floor of the mouth and enter the submental space so it will appear as a midline swelling in the upper neck that condition is called as plunging ranula here the point which is contrary to each other is this plunging ranula is a type of retention cyst whereas your normal ranula that is an extra vessation cyst arising from the sublingual gland the treatment is excision of the sublingual gland now during this excision which duct is usually injured that is your submandibular duct pleomorphic adenoma this is the most commonest type of parotid tumor 75 percentage of parotid tumor is accounted as pleomorphic adenoma more than 50 percentage of submandibular tumors is pleomorphic adenoma and less than 50 percentage of minor gland tumors usually in major glands you do surgical removal of the tumor now what we won't remember is what we do in case of minor salivary glands you do a local excision with 5 mm margin the measurement of the margin is important 5 mm margin Directly it was given as an option in a previous year question. Treatment of choice if superficial parotidectomy that is called as Patti's operation. The other names of Wharton's tumor has been asked repeatedly. Wharton's tumor is also known as adenolymphoma or papillary cyst adenoma lymphomatosa. Here it occurs only in parotid gland and tumor is mainly related to cigarette smoking an important point which can be asked in future is that in 9 mm tc per technetate scan this Wharton's tumor is shown as a hot spot whereas all the others other tumors they show cold spot this is just an additional point to remember adenoid cystic 
carcinoma is characterized by relentless perineural spread ton of times the question has been asked which carcinoma shows this characteristic feature of perineural spread so that is your adenoid cystic carcinoma and the other name of an adenoid cystic car- carcinoma is pivotal that is cylindroma cylindroma now sometimes during distant metastasis into the lung it forms multiple cannonball tumors multiple cannonball tumors next is your jogren syndrome in terms of jogren syndrome what is most important is the associated connective tissue disorders or disorders to which jogren syndrome is associated you have to remember mainly six uh conditions that is keratocongenitivitis sicca xerostomia rheumatoid arthritis again here we have been familiar with the dry eyes and dry mouth you will definitely remember that and in terms of rheumatoid arthritis question or the option can be indirectly asked if it is rh factor positive and sometimes jogren syndrome is associated with systemic lupus erythematosus again in the option it can be asked as sle primary biliary cirrhosis and scleroderma so these associated conditions are very important now what is the difference between primary jogren syndrome and secondary jogren syndrome if it is only dry eyes and dry mouth that combination then it is called as primary jogren syndrome whereas dry eyes dry mouth connective tissue disorder usually the connective tissue di- disorder will be rheumatoid arthritis then it is called as your secondary jogren syndrome continuing with the investigations pyelography you can see total parenchymal destruction in pyelography then auto body screening can be done next is ESR ESR is moderately raised moderately raised ESR positive anti nuclear factors these four are important okay total parenchymal destruction auto antibody screening raised ESR positive anti nuclear factors next xerostomia what are the complications rampant caries and destructive periodontal disease these are the major complications of xerostomia submandibular gland excision three ca- cranial nerves are at risk during removal of submandibular salivary gland those are your mandibular branch of facial nerve lingual nerve and hypoglossal nerve only three nerves that is your mandibular branch of facial nerve your lingual nerve and hypoglossal nerve and warthen's duct is associated to lingual nerve during parotidectomy auriculotemporal nerve can be injured which leads to gustatory sweating and sorry gustatory sweating and that is called as your frey's syndrome this is it now we'll be doing in the next video question and answers that is your mcqs related to all these topics your salivary gland disorders and i would like to thank all of you for listening to the video and if you have any queries feel free to comment in the comment section below thank you so much